In 1955, a couple of Astoria businessmen got a group of local men to dress as clowns and enter the Astoria Regatta Parade. The dozen guys had so much fun they did it again a year later and eventually branched out traveling the Northwest to parades as the Astoria Clowns. They had a goal in mind to promote the idea of a bridge being built, bringing Oregon and Washington together. Bob Lovell owned the Chevrolet dealership in Astoria and will always hold the record of the longest participating Astoria clown. That's over 50 years of clowning around. The clowns were then going to go to various parades around the state and promote the bridge. They'd have some brochures and they'd pass out whatever literature they could and talk to people about the bridge. At times we've had two different district attorneys We've had uh, MDs, psychiatrists, uh, chiropractors, dentists. Uh, we also have a guy that drives a garbage truck. We have uh, guys that drive log trucks. We have uh, one guy that was a cab driver, always down on his luck. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wide uh, spread of the community, really. And so we bought that car for the $200 and then got it painted a bright yellow. A bridge on both sides. Let's build the bridge. Carol Wildreds did the drawings on, on the bridge. We had a very attractive bridge. I think it was a toll, it was a uh, suspension bridge which they never built. They built a cantilever but we were in the Rose Parade, the first and only time the clowns were ever in the daylight Rose Festival Parade in 1960 I think it was. But the, the Rosarians didn't really think the clowns belonged with all the dignity and the roses, so they put us in the very back of the parade with the Jay Stevens disaster car. We kind of were a mop-up. We never went back to the Rose Festival parade as such, but we started going to as many as uh, 15 to 20 parades a year. So we had more invitations than we could handle for, for a time. His costume came because of Bob Ayers, who was a clown that we'd <coughs> enlisted. I think. And uh, several of us had started to learn to play the big bagpipes, and the instructor ran off with the choir director. For, he was a pastor at the church in Klaskenine, and he took off with the choir director and left his wife and children. And he took the money that we'd paid for our tuition to be bagpipe players. But anyway, Bob Ayers said, you want to be a bagpipe player? Here's a bagpipe. And he gave me this little toy bagpipe. He said, why don't you be a clown bagpiper? Those guys are so pompous, they need somebody to bring them down to size. So and Mary claims that uh, she doesn't like my costume, but she made it. So I had a made-to-order costume from the bagpipe era. The problem was finding a gimmick. We all worked on gimmicks, and that's when Chuck and... Jack used to come up with all these neat things where we built Fort Clatsop out of cardboard and set it up over one of the manholes. Everybody climbed in and out of the manhole and I couldn't understand how so many clowns could be in that little square of cardboard because it must have been 15 or so piled out of the thing coming up out of the manhole. Well, a lot of times we got free beer. Somebody would say, oh, I'm glad to have you guys here and have a round on us, you know. No, we weren't supposed to drink, but nobody paid much attention to that. But we went to little towns like uh, well, PL up in Washington, which is practically a one street town, and we went to, like you say, Seattle and Vancouver, BC, Ellensburg, and some bigger towns. Harry Duff uh, led the parade one year, really. The uh, Clowns were supposed to be pre-parade. We were supposed to go down and you know, warm up the crowd that there was a parade coming and so forth. So we were we were ahead of everything. And pretty soon the parade caught up to us because by the time we'd stop and visit with kids and so forth, the parade moved right along and it caught up with us. And here was Harry riding his bicycle. So he decided to go over and greet the 
Prime Minister of Canada, who was Lester Pearson at that time, and he went tootling over there in his unicycle, and my gosh, the Secret Service or whatever the uh, Canadian equivalent of that is, grabbed around, circled him, and what in the world is he doing? Going to interfere with our Prime Minister. They thought maybe he was a saboteur or going to shoot him or something. Our numbers kept increasing. We finally put a limit of 25 clowns, and then eventually it became 30, and then it was 35. But Jarmo was the one that said, everybody has to be anonymous. We don't want anybody to take any publicity about this. And we're just clowns. We're not names. Oh, Jack, Jack I think, started ride, riding on one of those goofy bicycles. That, he didn't have a stick right at the beginning. And up at Aberdeen, he made a wheelie, or he was rearing back in his bicycle, and he fell over on his back. I don't know if you ever heard that story or not. He really hurt his back. But the crowd all cheered. They thought it was part of his act. So that was the end of his bicycle experience. He said, I've got to do something different from that. So he came up with this gimmick, this fake camera. He had a tripod with three broomstick legs, and he put a black cloth or something over his head and pretended he was taking a picture, and then they'd make a flash. I think he had a flash, flash gun or something, if I remember rightly. And then he'd hand the, the subject of his picture, supposedly a picture of themselves, and it was a picture of a monkey. The story about the unicycles is a story in itself. They decided they had to do something like that. And, uh, and I guess it was Sam Yaki's basement. Three or four of them decided they were going to learn to ride unicycles. They spent all winter working on it. They had mattresses around the walls so they wouldn't hurt themselves if they fell. And uh, Floyd was the last one, I think, to learn how to ride the unicycle. But uh, Harry Duff and Jarma and uh, Floyd, maybe one or two others, got into the unicycle business. That was really part of our show, was to have these guys in their unicycles. Harry Duff had the most fun, though. He had the extra little wheel and made pretend like he's riding a bicycle, and he'd wave the front, pick up the front wheel and wave it around at the crowd. He loved chasing the barmaids in the in the uh, clubs too. The little lady in Ellensburg at the Moose Lodge. Every year, she was just terrified of him. He'd come in with his unicycle and he'd pedal the unicycle around the room, chasing the barmaid with her. Drink, tra drink, drink trays. Push for the bridge started about 1955. Actually, Louis Wright's father, Floyd Wright, probably was the first one. He was on the port commission. Said, Let's get this bridge started. And the chamber picked it up and had a committee with Dan Thiel and Stan Daniels and others pushing it. And the clowns came into the picture. But by the time the first legislative session was, I think, 57, where they put up a little money for a study. In 59, they had a study plus engineering work done, and finally in 61, it passed. So it took five or six years to get everything sold. The newspaper editor in Salem said it was a bridge to nowhere. And uh, so Chuck Defoe, who's noted as our founder of the Clowns, he and Dick Bettendorf went to every, at least Chuck did, Dick sometimes, went to every newspaper editor in the state of Oregon, any weekly paper, any paper he could get invited to, and talk to him about the bridge, trying to get public opinion that we needed that bridge. So the clowns were only part of the show. We, we certainly can't take full credit by a long ways. This is the gate to the giant bridge that links the states of Washington and Oregon. That is the $24 million structure that stretches more than four miles a crowd have gathered to dedicate this span. The clowns got to be the first car over the first, first official car over the bridge. We were the first ones to pay a toll. First day it was free. We, we got to go free on it and we took the, the mayor and so forth. And we had visitors from Waldorf, Germany. We loaded a couple of them in, in the car with us. And, uh, and we had an exciting trip across the bridge and back, and then the next morning we lined up at 6 o'clock to be the first ones to pay the toll. In then they took the toll off. We were the <coughs> first car that got across without having to pay a toll also. We ran out of gas on the bridge, by the way, on that trip. 
So Vic Watson came down from Portland and said, the clowns haven't changed. We used to run out of gas fairly often. The gas gauge was all backwards on that car. It was wired wrong, and so it showed full and it was empty and empty when it was full. So somebody got fooled by that and forgot to put gas in it. We ran out of gas. We're clear over on the Washington side. And uh, as I say, people did pass us by and wave to us and thought it was great fun. We were blocking, half blocking the bridge. As the celebration of the bridge unfolds, the Astoria clowns will participate and entertain as they have been doing since 1955. And another group will be celebrating also, a dozen sons and daughters of an original Astoria clown. After finding the original clown car in the desert and restoring it, they too will participate and celebrate what their fathers helped to accomplish, the building of the bridge to nowhere, the Astoria Megler Bridge. This is the only group photo of the clowns in street clothes. Sam Yaki, Chuck Defoe, Jack Daly, Vic Watson, Dr. Harry Duff, Vern Mogensen, Dr. Jorma Lamasar, Floyd Reith, John Gustafson, Bob Graves, and Lewis Wright. The Astoria Clowns.